Hello, I'm Brandon McDaniel. In this lecture, we'll discuss Chapter 2 of Stephen Mithen's book, The Singing Neanderthals. More than cheesecake? Is music no more than auditory cheesecake, as Pinker would have us believe? This is the question that Mithen asks us at the beginning of the second chapter of The Singing Neanderthals. We touched on this analogy briefly in the last lecture, but to review, let's describe Pinker's assertion one more time. The Harvard psychologist Steven Pinker argued in his 1997 book, How the Mind Works, that an analogy could be made between music and cheesecake, the idea being that the capacity for cheesecake making did not evolve but tickles our cravings for fat and sugar, and that similarly, music did not evolve for any particular survival or reproductive purposes, but simply exists due to its ability to exploit our language sense in a way we find pleasurable. Mithen argues that we should not take this hypothesis at face value, but that rather we should explore the similarities and differences of language and music in their external features and their function in the brain to arrive at a more accurate answer. Is music really just auditory cheesecake? Before we can tackle the issue, we have to agree on some basic definitions of music and language. But those definitions can often be problematic. Even in Western music, there's been considerable debate about what music even is. The score pictured here um, of John Cage's 4 minutes and 33 seconds is a prime example of such a controversy, with performances being totally silent. Across cultures, there is considerable variation in what's considered music, with some languages even lacking a word for music in its totality, containing separate words, for example, for religious music, or dance music. Language is sometimes considered to be a more straightforward phenomenon to define, but there are considerable problems there as well. For example, a definition of language proposing that language consists of words with agreed-upon meanings connected together by rules of grammar falls short of describing the often messy communication of everyday speech. Further muddying the waters, some cultures have forms of vocal expression that straddle the line between music and language, such as the mantras of Eastern religions. For all the difficulty at arriving at a definition of either music or language that applies cross-culturally, one approach to the question is to look at what aspects of the phenomena exist across cultures. We've already established that both music and language exist in some form in all human societies. We can observe that although language itself is a universal phenomenon, its form varies across cultures through different languages. Music operates similarly, with musical styles and conventions differing across cultures. In this way, we can say that both music and language are universal human phenomena, although their individual expressions are quite culturally diverse. In this respect, however, one major difference between music and language is that while a sentence can be translated from one language to another and retain most of its meaning, perhaps the same cannot be said for music. So, despite cultural difference, there are some aspects of musical expression that are so ubiquitous across human cultures that it's appropriate to call them universal, John Cage notwithstanding. One would be some form of song, another would be some form of dance. Almost all cultures have um, some form of repetition and variation in their music, um, and rhythmic structures based on note length and dynamic stress, also known as meter. Um, those appear across cultures. Most cultures use music within their religious ceremonies, with some exceptions, and, Mithen argues, the capacity for appreciating music is a human universal that's shared across cultures in the same way a capacity for language acquisition is. Language and music also share forms of expression, and each of these forms of expression have a biological basis in the brain. Both speech and music can be expressed vocally, both have gestural components, music via things such as dance, and language via sign language or even body movements while speaking, and both have the potential to be written down or notated. The way humans acquire and develop competence in both music and language share similar characteristics as well. Children listen and slowly learn the tools and components of both the spoken language of their culture and informal forms of music making such as singing simple songs or dancing. More cognitively demanding forms of both music and language, such as reading and writing, or performance on a musical instrument, are not 
always easily learned, and those who study language education know a cognitively normal child will most likely be able to speak without schooling, but schooling is required for literacy. The same is true for the more cognitively demanding forms of music making. Language and music also share the fact that they are hierarchical combinatorial systems that contain recursion. When we say that both music and language are hierarchical systems, we mean that the larger meanings are constructed of smaller constituent parts. For example, in language, words combine to make phrases, which combine to make full linguistic communication. Likewise, music combines discrete sounds or tones into larger motivic or melodic forms, which go on to form entire musical statements. When we say that these systems are recursive, what we mean is that we can embed one of these components within components of a similar type. For example, I can take a fairly simple sentence, such as, he was looking at me, and embed similar components into the sentence to say, he was looking at me to see if I was looking at the dog. I can recursively embed similar concepts to make a hypothetically infinite number of sentences, such as, he was looking at me to see if I was looking at the dog to see if the dog was looking at the cat, and so on. Musical elements are combined in similar ways, and the cleverness and interest of those combinations are often a key component to conceptions of musical quality. Chomsky, Hauer, and Fitch of Harvard have, uh, have asserted that this combinatorial aspect of language is the only part of language with no parallel in the animal kingdom, in animal communication. Um, Mithen asserts that the same could not easily be said of music. Sorry, rather, Mithen asserts that the same could easily be said of music. <laughs> Uh, a final point here is that the rhythmic structures also play a key role in language and music, and that this aspect of language is often neglected. While music and language undeniably share certain structural elements, the type of meaning they convey is very different. In language, each word has a discrete and specific meaning. Apple means the red or green fruit you can eat that keeps the doctor away. The discrete meanings of words in a sentence can be deconstructed, and the individual words maintain their meanings outside the context of the sentence. If I say the apple is red, it still means apple if I say the apple fell on my head. Apple can be extracted from the sentence and retain its meaning. Music, however, is far more abstract. The messages or meanings that music may convey are not easily understood as component parts, but rather have to be taken in the context of the entire musical event. A single note of a Bach violin concerto played by Joshua Bell by itself may not have a discrete symbolic meaning, but it would be hard to deny the existence of a certain holistic meaning emanating from the full performance of that violin concerto by Joshua Bell. Another major difference between music and language lies in grammar. Uh, as Chomsky established, Language operates according to a universal grammar across cultures consisting of three components. Syntax, which is the set of rules which words can be combined. Morphology, which is the way that words and parts of words are combined to make more complex words. And phonology, which governs the sound system of a particular language. Music, on the other hand, does not have a universal grammar, but rather various grammars that are culturally specific. These rules and structures are typically considered the component parts of particular musical styles. And those musical styles change much faster than languages do. Language, due to its job as a medium for communicating about actual objects and events in the world, has to remain relatively consistent across the landscape of those that speak it. If it were to vary too much or change too fast, the public may not have understood, for example, the presidential speech depicted here. Music, however, is able to change and shift much faster. One reason for this is the fact that variation in and of itself is often seen as a valuable part of musical expression, and musical innovation is often welcomed, although this is not necessarily the case across cultures. But even if musical innovation is not valued, music is more likely to evolve at a faster rate due to the fact that the retention of consistent meaning is not necessarily uh, part of music. Retention of consistent meaning is not necessary in music as it is in language. 
Even being unfamiliar with Western music, it's still possible to listen and enjoy the music of Yo-Yo Ma and the music of a wide range of other cultures with far less effort than would be necessary to fluently speak even one new language. To sum up, language can be characterized as primarily representational. That is to say, its most obvious purpose is that of information transmission, or reference to specific things that exist in the world. Music, on the other hand, may have a primarily manipulative function. That is to say, it has an ability to manipulate our emotions to make us feel something, manipulate our psychology to put us in a certain state of mind, or even manipulate our body into moving, as dance music is often designed to do. As we will explore in later lectures, it's clear that music has a psychological relationship to emotion that is far different than that of language. Given the fact that emotions also have immense biological value that is different than the value of representational communication, it would be wise to consider the possibility that music is not simply an evolutionary byproduct of language, as Pinker has argued, but a product of the human mind with significant value in and of itself. If we take the idea that music evolved as a biologically useful human behavior as a basic assumption, we're left to consider how that behavior came about. One idea is that music and language evolved independently as two different systems or mental modules in the brain. Mithen points out that given the overlaps in the brain and the overall similarities between music and language, this seems unlikely. The other idea is that music and language both evolved from a cognitive ancestor, or so-called musa-language, as the musicologist Stephen Brown has hypothesized. This is the hypothesis that seems most likely to Mithen, the one that is explored throughout the book, and the one which we will discuss in subsequent lectures. Thank you very much.